there is also unhappiness in our education sector, particularly amongst our teachers. Last week, a full-page advertisement was taken out indicating that school teachers were not happy about, well, a lot of things. And we'll talk about that in just a second. And why should we be concerned about all this? Well, it's very simple. New Zealand's schooling standards, or at least our, the, the children are being um, educated within our schools, seem to be falling on a pretty systemic basis against their international counterparts on all of the international standards tests uh, that have been prescribed over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, it has been lamented by many commentators, uh, in fact, just Professor Rata. Uh, for example, last week, uh, Elizabeth Rata, the Professor of Education, at Auckland University on the show, um, that New Zealand's standards are declining in good part because of what's happening in our schools. Um, To talk about that and related issues, we're joined by Wendy Bamford, um, who was involved in highlighting for us. Wendy, welcome to the show. Um, The plight of teachers and why you're all a bit grumpy at the moment. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Michael. Um, Yes, we are a bit grumpy at the moment. Um, I think perhaps one of my biggest grumps is the fact that uh, media and many experts keep dissing schools and keep talking about dropping standards. I think what a lot of people don't realise is that the type of education that is being offered in New Zealand schools is slightly different. And a lot of that for primary schools is not around testing, testing of national standards. No matter how much you weigh a pig, it's not going to make any difference to it. It's about deep learning. It's about learning skills for the future. And that might necessarily um, be top marks in reading or writing or whatever through a pencil and paper test. Um, Yeah, except the Ministry of Education, for example, are trying to bring in um, some literacy and some numeracy tests that um, they argue are necessary for us to be able to demonstrate uh, to, I guess, the parents of those kids, the wider community that New Zealand children are being educated satisfactorily, and you would know oh, yeah. as well as I um, what the results of those tests were. Um, it's, a, it's probably another bugbear of mine that the focus is on structured literacy. However, I've been in education 48 years now and I have seen the cycles go around from phonics to whole language to whatever. Many schools have not moved away from a structured literacy approach in that they teach phonetic analysis and they teach phonics. The focus should be on a balanced literacy program. Yes, they should be able to um, decode words. Yes, they should have really high levels of comprehension. They should have all of all of those skills but you don't um, but also they need those um, critical thinking skills those deep learning skills as well um, I think that we're getting a lot more needs in schools around literacy that um, I even just look at my own school that eight years ago uh, we had very very few children that had the high needs that they've got now and that's why many of us have had to um, put in specialist programs into our schools apart from what's happening in the classroom to be able to assist those children that have learning differences or have come through without those ready to read um, skills. Wendy, um, um, and just that, take which, me through. Which you, takes you, me back to why we're grumpy is because the staffing doesn't allow us to do that. When you've got a class of 34, and many of us, I know in Central, for example, have classes in year five and six, and sometimes in year three and four, with 34, 33, 34 children. That's what we've got at the moment in our classes from um, you know year four up. When you've got that and you add into that perhaps a couple of behavioural children, the children have got high behavioural needs. Then you add into that um, the, the three or four children who at the moment we remove to go out for um, instruction out of the classroom with one of our specialist teachers. And that specialist teacher we have to take out of our classroom teaching component. It's not on top of. Um, then, you know, you, it's a lot to ask of a teacher to cover both ends of that. And what about those kids at the other end that need the extension? That that's where that's where teachers start to get grumpy because society is all of a sudden throwing all of these things at us and saying fix it, but we're not resourced to do that. Um, we're I, not resourced for these. I'm not, I'm not going to argue resourced. with you on the points you make, but I I would just sort of suggest to you two things. You, you for example, are principal of a pretty high decile school, what they used to be known as a high decile, but it's a school that um, has relatively wealthy parents coming from 
relatively, I would imagine, educated backgrounds in comparison to a lot of other schools in New Zealand. Um, can I ask the obvious question? Is it the parents that make the ch child succeed or is it the teachers? Um, I'd only ask that question because there does seem to be a correlation between the aspirations and ambitions of parents and between the success of the children that they then have through our school system. What do you see well, as the issue? Well, can, can I respond with that to sure. say that I don't believe decile makes that much of a difference when it comes to resourcing of a school. Number one, a decile 10 school does not get resourced per student as much as a decile one. True. Number two, at the moment, um, decile a 10 at seven, eight, nine, eight, nine, ten schools do not get the 150 per child school donation. And I know from experience here that um, you, being in a high decile school does not mean that you're going to get those donations from parents. You do not. And it does not mean that you um, also have parents that are um, going to, um, you know, be able to participate in fundraising or bring extra money into the school. Um, no, that's not what know, I said. Though, I'm, what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that the parental background of a school like yours would generally mean that the kids that are walking in in year one at your school in your new entrance class, a little bit ahead of the game in terms of literacy and numeracy, etc. No, would disagree. I would have said oh, yes eight years ago. I don't say that anymore. No, you're saying to um, me, they, that, they, yeah, yep, they do, they do not. Then a lot of our children, and this is across nationally across are not coming with those skills. We're seeing a lot more children that have learning differences, dyslexic type tendencies. So not only are you, um, uh, you know, having to look at a, a, a classroom program teaching where you can do that balance of everything, uh, you're now having to look at taking those children that are easily distractible, that need that one-to-one -one teaching around phonics or um, even, even mathematics, um, you're having to look at providing for that learning environment as well. Uh, you know, in, in any class in New Zealand, you'd look, say, at a year six class or a year eight class, like I've, I've taught, you could have a child that's working at level one of the curriculum, but you could also have a child that's working uh, above that level in a curriculum. You've always got that wide diversity. Mm. Um, sort of which uh, leads you to the, why don't we stream then? so that you can actually teach all your year, year ones or the kids of, of similar ability at the same time? Because there are different abilities with different things. You actually have to assess uh, or screen or have a look as you are teaching the child to see what their next learning step is. We don't stream for ability or assess for ability. You assess for the next learning or teaching need. Right, so you're going to end up... And, that, and that, could be, that could be 30 different in each class. Oh, absolutely. Yes, so you don't get yeah, that no, 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 I, I And that's that. why I'm saying we need more teachers to our primary school teachers. We need more teachers on the ground in classrooms so we can work with smaller groups of children. We have the time to address those needs. Um, we, we need more teachers' aids in our classrooms because we've got a higher level of um, learning behaviours um, uh, coming into our schools. Um, also, things like autism, um, children with lots of, of different um, learning needs as well. Um, and, and we've got one uh, couple of children in our area who are highly, highly um, autistic and uh, they don't get full coverage from teacher aid. And both the children of these children that I know are runners, so they also leave the premises. They need full time, okay. full time, someone full time watching them. So if you've got a teacher doing that in a classroom, as well as looking after 33 other children, how does that work? Well, yeah, but, but wait on. I mean, I, I sat on Education Select Committee for six years. Uh, it, we were talking about mainstreaming when it came in. And at the time... They didn't fund it when they mainstreamed. Well, the, the deal yeah. back in the not late 1980s when mainstreaming came in, and you would have been just ta starting teaching possibly around that time, was that... When? The, the 1980s? Oh, no. <laughs> late 1980s? <laughs> I was well and well and truly in teaching. Oh, well, okay. and then I was right. actually a principal of the school, and then, and then okay. so yes. Well, then you would have seen that. Uh, I remember the question was well asked: that oh well, mainstream is such a bloody good idea. So we'll put all these children with the behavioural issues, and some with the learning difficulties, and some with the mental health issues as well. We'll put them all in the classrooms together, and you'll go for it, and the resources will attend. Now we all know what happened since then: the resources didn't follow. But That's right. I guess the question that I would have, and I, I listen, I think there's enormous sympathy out there to being a, a, a teacher. But at the moment, 
you'd have to say, wouldn't you, that you can't teach properly if you're having a greater proportion of your class filling those definitions that we've just talked about of children who are not um, able to be educated in the sort of normal fashion, if you like, and who do have special needs and you don't have the resources. Is that one of the reasons why you think our standards are dropping compared to the international marketplace? I think I think it puts a heck of a lot of pressure on a school. For example, in a school my size, we're sitting on 570. We were 800 um, a couple of years ago. Um, same pressures applied. And um, if you've got if you've got le- high learning needs and high behavioural needs in your classes, and you've got 34 kids in your classes, then you're going to have to put in a lot of extra support. So my leadership team, for example, actually go in and teach, take groups, take small groups. We employ two extra teachers, um, which makes up another teaching component that we're not funded for to teach, to try and cover for that. Uh, And and you just can't because you're not resourced. You need people to do it. You need, um, you know, you need the staffing. And And no, they haven't provided it. The other thing that they haven't provided, Michael, is the expertise. Um, Like if you've got a child who is highly autistic or uh, has some kind of learning need or some kind of emotional need, there is no one out there. And we have two or three really good ministry people, but they're spread so thinly across our schools because we're all crying out for that, that, that assistance. That expertise, the whole structure of learning support for schools, which is another thing um, that, you know, that we're campaigning on this time is not there. The funding's not there, the staffing's not there, the expertise is not there. And so that's putting a heck of a lot of pressure on our primary school teachers. Now you're never going to... Uh, I don't ex- oh, well, can on, I just ask you though? Wait, no, wait, 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 just, well, just a question there, uh, just on quality of teaching because you've just brought that issue up there. Um, uh, the, I, I, I don't suppose you'll ever confess, but is the quality of teaching those coming into the profession at the same level as when you first started teaching? Uh, put it this way, I think that um, this is the, the, the last five, ten years is the only time in my career where I have, I really come across an incompetent teacher. All, most of the teachers that I know in the primary services that I've taught with, that I employ, uh, high quality teachers. I do think pre-service training needs a big look at and I think the whole thing about um, beginning teachers coming into schools and what they know about curriculum, what they know about literacy, what they know about pedagogy, what they know about curriculum, um, you know, the learning areas, I don't think is up there. And I think that, that that lets us down because that's another thing that schools have to pick up. They have to bring on board all of these new teachers all these teachers coming from other countries, and that's another load on teachers and schools. All right, and principals. Now, mm. listen, I agree with you. And and uh, you, uh, on this show last week, we had Professor Elizabeth Rada from um, uh, Auckland University on exactly that issue, making exactly the same point that you've just made now too. Um, okay, mm. next next question. You're running a campaign. Is it national or is it regional? It's national. It's a national campaign. I'm wear two, I wear two hats in this. I'm a part of the Central Otago Principals Association and I'm also on the um, Central Otago um, exec of NZDI. Um, but I'm also um, a principal who's been around for a while and probably at the end of my career. And I could say I think I feel more concerned about education than I've ever felt throughout that career currently. Why? Because I think that um, that at the moment we've got really good people in schools we are losing. We are losing a lot of principals who are retiring early or who um, we, we, we're getting a situation where we've got very young um, people in principals' positions. We're not valuing those people with experience or expertise. We're not giving them the time. And I look at my teachers, uh, you know, we, we, we are... Part of the push is pushing for parity with secondary. We get an hour non-contact time a week, and that works out at about 12 minutes a day. My staff are usually here about the same time as me, between quarter to eight and eight o'clock, 
and many of them are still here. When I go to leave, I try to leave um, relatively um, on time, but I often get away sort of 5, 5.30. Most of my staff are still here. Two nights a week we have meetings. Uh, they have pod meetings. They have planning meetings every other night. So teachers really are working at this school anyway, 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock, and then you've still got to go home and write your reports after all of those meetings. You've still got to go home and do your own written planning or your bits and pieces. So inevitably, I can arrive at school and I've got teachers here getting reading books, getting bits and pieces together. We need more time while the children are here at school so we can sit next to a child and work with them um, while they're uh, looking, say, say for example, doing a reading screener. So you can actually identify those next steps. You shouldn't be doing those assessments at five to nine in the morning while the bell's ringing and children are coming in. But that's what we have to do because most of our day from nine to three is around deliberate acts of teaching. We need parity with our secondary colleagues with regard to that. We also so you're need not talking about, so you've got, you've got parity for uh, salary, you're talking about parity for working no, conditions. No, we haven't even got salary for, we haven't even got parity for salary really, not for equal positions. For example, they get a lot more management units, that they, the um, secondary get a lot more management units, they get a lot more time off. They also get a lot more staffing. Um, they are also funded at a much better rate than primary. They can, they've got counsellors in school. They've got um, uh, social workers in school. They've got all of that. Primary don't have any of that. I'm the social worker. I'm the guidance counsellor. So my leadership team. But we get, I've got four in my leadership team, but we only get just on two non-teaching positions funded. That's me and one other. Now, how ridiculous is that? Mm. Okay. The rest are all considered to be classroom teachers. Um, okay. which, so you're which, talking, yeah. well, gosh, you know, join health, join police. There's a whole series of people that would suggest that they're in crisis at the moment. Yeah, um, I would probably agree with that if they, uh, uh, if they are being funded and resourced on the same level that we are. And yet, I think morale, morale. Um, well, that was uh, the next thing I was going to ask moment. you about yep. was morale because um, it's very interesting. I'm observing through a, a sort of a, 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 an in-law family member at the moment who's just entered the teaching and the primary teaching profession. And yep. um, and one of the points that she makes, and I'll come back to the she bit in a second too. But one of the points that she makes is that um, there is uh, a, a, an issue with morale. Um, she thinks, in in Most definitely. in the wider issue. Mm -hmm. um, now, next issue though, she. I have had enough of 90% of your primary teaching positions being filled by women. If this was 90% men, we would argue that there was institutional and systemic sexism um, in primary school teaching. Why don't we say that with the lack of men in the profession? Hello, she's dropped off. Don't know where. Um, Wendy's just dropped off, so my apologies. I would have liked an argument on that one. Well, not an argument, but an answer. Uh, but, oh, can I tell you, uh, she didn't, the school didn't drop from 800 to 570 because of anything that Wendy Bamford or Wanaka Primary School had done wrong, can I just say. Um, they opened up a new school. 570 is a pretty big primary school, can I say. All right. So just wanted to explain that. It was nothing to do with any of the teaching or lack of confidence or anything like that. Um, because of the numbers, they just opened a new school in Monaco. So there are new, uh, I think there are three primary schools here now too. But um, it is one of the growth areas. Um, anyhow, your thoughts on that one. Um, Wendy, sorry. Again, because you, you, uh, hello, you, I, hello, you, I lost there. you. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, I'm here. I'm yeah, sorry. I lost you. That's all right. Yeah. I mean, it happens in Central too often, doesn't it? Um, can I what, just... What does? Sorry. Oh, oh, oh you've been dropping out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I, I thought you'd hung up on me. I no, thought I'd won, no, Michael. I thought, gosh, I've done, I've done something wrong. Um, no, no, you haven't. Um, no, I was just trying to explain to our listeners that the reason your school dropped from 800 to 570 wasn't because you're a bad principal, but because they'd opened a, <laughs> opened a new school. <laughs> yes? No, sorry, say again? That, that you know, they'd opened a new school, and that's why your numbers had dropped so exponentially quickly over a period of time. You yes, said, but we knew that was coming. 
and that's why I've, I'm, yeah, we knew, I knew that was coming because we went up to 800 and we had to do a very rapid build. And then um, I, uh, we, we work collaboratively with the ministry around the build of the new school. Um, so we knew it was coming and I had lots of fixed term positions in place because I knew that that would be dropping. So did you, those people transfer to the new school? No, you're not allowed to do that. They have to advertise. And yes, one of my DPs um, came to see me and said he'd like to move over. He'd been with me for eight years here. And he went over there. Um, also, uh, a couple of my teachers went over too, but with my full um, backing, it was great. Because we work very closely together, the schools in Upper Clutha. We have got a very strong collegial principal group and school group. Now, what I want to know, uh, and that's the question I asked you, but we've cut off. So, yep. All right, what was it? And it was this. 90% of all the teachers in the primary profession are female. If they were male, we would be talking about institutional sexism in the primary teaching profession. Why don't we talk about that? with the lack of males in the profession. It never used to be like that, but it seems to have become chronic. Why don't males teach in primary schools? Um, well, it's really interesting. So I, I had five, six ma males on my staff, which is quite a number. As I've said, I've shared a couple of those with the new school. And one of mine um, has recently just gone up to Matt because he'd been here eight years. And once again, after they've been in the school eight years um, and they're beginning teachers, I always suggest that they move on so that they experience a different learning culture, a different, you know, they keep growing as teachers, if you like. Our biggest problem is we advertise and men do not apply. Um, I've got an amazing DP here who gets really, really upset because we go to courses where they say, you shouldn't hug children, you shouldn't pick up children, you shouldn't do this with children, you shouldn't do that with children. I just think it's too hard for men. I think that the whole PC thing about how men are in schools and, and things that have happened have made men very anxious about apply, going into teaching and there are some great men in teaching. But the other thing that it comes down to, if I can see a man and a woman who are equally qualified and have the same skills, I'll pick the man. But very often that, that doesn't happen because you're out of a job of 60 um, applicants, two of those might be men. If you're lucky. Mm. And but I, just not the men coming into <coughs> early childhood or teaching. And that's because of the whole thing about um, feeling at risk within a primary school or an early childhood. No, I see my son, who's now be in year 10 next year. Yep. He hasn't had a male to school teacher. Yep. Um, in his entire yep. time. And, yeah, and that and would be right because they're not, they're not there. They're not there to a point. They don't apply. Well, they're not going to... No, no, they're, they're obviously not going to teachers' colleges. That's, yeah, story. that's, yeah. that's the issue, that's isn't right. it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But see, then I would, I would reframe the whole pre-training stuff too. I wouldn't have a teachers' college or a university. I'd have them being trained as it like an apprenticeship in school. But that's okay. That's me. No, 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 no. <laughs> Listen, it's, it's got to work better than it is at the moment because oh, it ain't working at the moment. Yeah. No, and I'm, I'm lucky that I have got amazing men that I try and keep. It sounds terrible, doesn't it? But um, yeah, amazing male teachers. I've also got amazing female teachers. Um, but I, I get what your point is. There are not enough men in there. But I don't think that's um, I don't think that's any problem with schools. That's a problem with the whole social system in New Zealand. I think, and the and the view that um, men should not be around little children. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, mm. Thank you very much, Wendy. I, I oh, can I just ask you how much longer have you got before you retire? Uh, well, I, I could have many, many years because um, I think to retire, and um, Sharon Boosie, you probably know very well. Yes, I do, yeah. Uh, and so Sue so Heath, who was the principal at Howie Flat, have all said to me, you'll know when you want to retire. But I love, I'm in my happy place. I love my, I love being with kids. Uh, I didn't want to go and work for the ministry. I never have. I didn't want to go and be a consultant. I don't want to go and anything like that. I love being in school. So when my team tell me that I can't do it anymore or I, wake up, or I wake up one morning and believe me they would okay? Yeah, yeah. or I wake up one morning and think this isn't me anymore, I won't get up and go this is what rocks my boat, I love it Good on you Wendy, lovely to talk to you yeah. best okay. of luck to you, Cheers. thank you, okay right. bye bye, bye. alright, um, that is the um, cause um, that um, is, you'll see a national newspaper's 
um, and I guess uh, in your local community newspapers as well throughout New Zealand, you'll see that particular cause being adopted. Started last week. Uh, it is, if you think our health sector is in crisis, uh, if you think uh, we have a law and order crisis, um, then just try our primary teaching uh, profession as well. Um, do we have an educational crisis? Gosh, we've had people on the show in the last couple of weeks that would say yes. It's a very tough time for this country at the moment. And you can't tell me we haven't spent lots of money because we've spent pots of money over the last three years but it doesn't seem to have been spent um, particularly improving educational outcomes, improving health outcomes, or making us feel any safer. Just goes to so, you see. You can spend as much money as you like, but you can't necessarily get quality for that money. 